Thank you for coming. This is the uh, April 2015 first Wednesday presentation for the Mill Valley Historical Society. And I'm thrilled to introduce tonight to you, if you don't already know, I'm Huey Johnson, to give us a presentation on a range of things. But first of all, I'm Bill Stock. I'm the president of the Mill Valley Historical Society. And I'm thrilled that so many people showed up here tonight. As many of you know, Huey Johnson is an environmentalist and a practical visionary widely recognized for his pioneering work as a conservationist and environmental policymaker. He is the founder and president of Resource Renewal Institute here in Mill Valley, an incubator for the transformational ideas that challenge the piecemeal way that natural resources are managed in favor of long-term comprehensive policies that will guarantee the health of the planet and a high quality of life for future generations. And he's a leading voice for green plans, integrated environmental strategies that are a proven and effective way to protect and sustain the environment. On a more local note, Huey, and his, as you probably know, Huey and his colleagues in the past have saved vast stretches of, of land, preserve them in Marin County and, of course, elsewhere. But in our, right in our backyard, we have Tennessee Valley and the surrounding areas. And I, I guess I feel a personal level of gratitude to them because I've enjoyed those areas for decades, as I'm sure many of you have too. So I feel really fortunate that Huey uh, agreed to be here tonight. So, but tonight, Huey will reflect on five decades of environmental preservation and policy work as well as looking forward to the sort of policies that should be pursued in the future and the need for advocacy to make those things happen. In putting these remarks together, I was faced with a bit of a conundrum, which was how can I tell you about all the things he and his colleagues have done and not take up the whole evening? So what I did is I sort of went back to digital plagiarism. And we've posted a really excellent article on the Mill Valley Historical Society website, which I would encourage you to read because it's a very comprehensive um, review of, of all of that work and where they're going in the future. And if you want, you can also join the society while you're there. <laughs> so let me talk about logistics just a little bit. We have to be out of the library by 9, so we need to break it off at 8.45. Huey's going to talk and show some videos that are actually quite special. Or they're new. They really haven't been seen by others. And so it's sort of an a opening or a film opening tonight for some of this. Um, so he'll do his presentation. And then we'll take some questions and answers. But that will have to be cut off at 845. Um, for those of you that can help at the end, we also need to break the library down because it's got to be ready for operation in the morning. So again, thank you very much for being here. And please welcome Huey Johnson. Testing, I guess it's on. Can you hear me? Uh, louder? Does that work? All right. Well, I'm astonished to see so many people turn out. Um, the Historical Society's work here in the library is very important. It's been useful to me on several occasions that have been very, very critical. One was, there's an old saying, there's something I'd done, and there's an old saying that takes three people to deal with an idea, an accomplishment. The person who thinks it up, the person who does it, and the person who takes credit for it. <laughs> and this is one of those things where the guy was taking credit for something I'd done. And normally if that happens, I wouldn't mind, but he was very pompous about it. And so I questioned him and he got angry about it and so on. So I went down the, in the library and there was all the records proving me right, as it was. And uh, I made him redo the book he was working on, which he had. <laughs> I feel like all of you feel very fortunate 
to live in Marin. And I've had the good life of it every morning for 50 years doing exactly what I want to do. Been in the same house, married to the same wonderful wife, and uh, enjoyed the community tremendously. And every time I'm away, I always think, gee, what am I doing here? <laughs> and uh, it seems to me things that may be of interest to you would be further discussions about land saving stories. A lot of landscape in Marin has been preserved by a cadre of environmentalists. It was as though there was a wave in surfing terms, and I was there in the early 60s and got on the wave and rode it. And it's now dissipated and flattened out. And there's a new wave coming, and I'll, I'll deal with that. As I look back at the uh, beginnings for me here, I was in a PhD program. Well, I was, I was working for Lives Corporation very successfully, but very unhappily. And I quit after a while and bummed around the world for a couple of years alone. And I really wanted to study history and the pragmatic results of resource shortages. The uh, problems the Japanese had that led to World War II, the uh, walk over old battlefields and so on it was a great, very important experience. And I met my wife on a trip. She was an American girl over there on vacation. And uh, that was a prize for some dimensions. <laughs> The uh, first, when I was in a PhD program, I applied for and got a job with the Nature Conservancy. And I was the eighth employee. I didn't really know much about the organization, but it was going to be in San Francisco. And I thought, boy, that's for me. And I'd been here on occasion in business work. And uh, so we got out here and uh, really didn't have much money to start a graduate school. And somebody said, well, you can go to Muir Beach and sleep on the beach for 50 cents a night. There were some hippies out there, and they'll guard the place and your car and all your stuff. So we went out there, and we spent the first several nights in Marin County sleeping on the beach at Muir Beach. And it was interesting because the properties on both sides of Muir Beach later I worked on and preserved. Uh, Green Gulch, now Zen Farm, was one of them. And uh, Spindrift Point on the right was the other. And uh, both were very interesting. The Spindrift Point one was owned by an author, a famous seaman, single-handed sailor. And he was just a wonderful guy. And he, he made enough money to buy that place by running vodka during Prohibition <laughs> between San Francisco and Hong Kong. And he would get a job, he was on an old tramp steamer, and he would stand watch whenever they were in port so everybody else could go ashore. He had arrangements in the Asian end of it. They'd come and lay the bottles on the, on the bottom of the engine room and cover it with plaster and put real awful grease on it. So when the inspectors came down the ladder, the white gloves, they would just look at this old thing and never look at it too closely. Same thing happened here. But it led to the preservation of that place and several very good books he wrote. The... Uh, some of the, you've seen the film, I think. How many of you here have seen Rebels, the, the film? We got it? That's why you're here. That's a, a lovely film and very interesting, obviously. The, uh, one of the first projects of, of interest was St. Hilary's, the church in Tiburon. And a group of elderly people, women, called me up. I just arrived, just opened the office. I was an eighth employee of the Nature Conservancy. And they said, young man, we understand you save land. We want you to get over here and save St. Hilary's Church. <laughs> and I said, ladies, we don't save buildings. We save natural areas. <laughs> well, these ladies had some clout. One was named Livermore, for instance. And I got a quick call from the president of the organization saying, we don't know what the hell you're doing out there, but you know, some pay some attention to us. So we went and saved St. Hilary's Church. And then another wonderful story was the Tam Marsh. If you go from Tam Junction up to Redwood High along the railroad, that marsh was owned by 
a syndicate of developers. And everybody wanted it saved, and I was negotiating with them, and uh, not making much headway. And there was a big court brawl going on about saving the bay at the same time. And the judge finally ruled, he said, look, I'm going to give all the landowners along the bay two months to prove their land is dry. And you've got to have dry land, and then you can get a permit to develop it. If it's not dry, if it's a marsh, you can't ever again. Well, there was a big rush to get dredges working the very next morning. And uh, immediately, the Tam Marsh was dredged quite a ways out that they owned. And um, they pumped it out. And within a couple of nights, there was a storm. And somebody <laughs> went out there and with a hole and dug a hole in the dike. And the water rushed through and filled it again. And this kept happening, and these guys were sure I was doing it, and I wasn't. But finally, they said, okay, we're, t we're tired of this. They sold it to me. They said, fair enough, we'll save it. Obviously, if the community cares that much. And years later, I was at a cocktail party, and some of you will remember a person named Elizabeth Twilliger. <laughs> and Elizabeth was a wonderful character. She came up to me with her eyes twinkling, and she said, Huey. Did you ever figure out who she knew I was being blamed for? I said, no, do you know? She says, yes, it was me. <laughs> so there you go. The, uh, another fun story was a pole farm at Bolinas. It was owned by the Radio Corporation of America, and for years I'd been eyeing that thing. And I was negotiating on Green Gulch and had tried to get the county to acquire it as an education center. They wouldn't do it. And uh, I got to meet the head of the Zen Center, which I knew little about, but he invited me down to their Tassajara retreat. And in the hot tub after dinner, they have a big hot tub that holds about 50 people, some guy said, somebody said, hey, can anybody give me some advice? I'm a, arrived from New York, I'm a realtor artist. And I, I said, well, I've been trying to meet somebody that knows some, some high-level executive in RCA. I've got a project I've worked on for years. This is in the dark. And he said, well, it just happens that the corporate counsel of RCA is my fishing partner. Maybe you'd want to go fishing. And I said, boy, I would. And he called one Friday, and uh, we were out at sea the next morning and had the corporate counsel cornered. And it wasn't long before we had an appointment with the president of RCA. And they owned three and a half miles of coastline in Bolinas and another several miles out at Point Reyes. And the pole farms were places with early radio had to be point to point. It didn't follow the curvature of the earth, so they had to get a high pole and so on. But once that was solved, they had this property and had no real use for it. So we ended up with an appointment with the president and the attorney here Doug Ferguson, who many of you will know, lives in the county, is in the city. <clears throat> and we went to New York, and I wanted to impress these guys, so I borrowed a very fancy leather briefcase from a very successful attorney friend of mine. And uh, I wanted to act like I had some stature in the world. And we were so green, we were just shaking, you know. We, so we go in this big skyscraper. But the meeting went for another hour, so we went down in the basement. It was an Italian restaurant. And in the dark, we were practicing our moves, like basketball players, kind of. I was going to move this. And, uh, but we had lunch as long as we were at it. So we went back up at 2 o'clock. We were ushered into a room, huge room with a big round table. And we were <coughs> taking the two chairs, and then the other door opened, and in came about a dozen corporate executives, along with the president of RCA. And we sat down, very formal. And I said, they said, well, I said, well, gentlemen, this is my proposal. And I opened up this fancy leather briefcase. There was a pile of spaghetti <laughs> on the paper. And it was a great break because these guys, <laughs> we, were, we were desperate to look serious and successful. It wasn't working. And those executives just went into hysterics. The more we struggled to look impressive. Anyway, finally in the end, I said, look. And they gave it to us. We ended up 
getting that property. <clears throat> and that was uh, particularly memorable. Um, I think of the uh, Green Gulch Ranch, the Zoom Center now, a beautiful place. And they have a lovely garden there. If you haven't walked in it, it's a fun thing to do. Um, the, I, uh, these, so many memories rush back as I was thinking about, well, I've got a long list of projects. Which ones will I select? And um, another little one, the ferry landing over in the uh, Corte Madeira Marsh. Everybody was all, developers had gotten it all set to d subdivide and build, on, but not where it is. And this side, not the other side. And <clears throat> we went to the owners, an elderly couple who own part of it, and ask if we could option it from them. They said, sure. So we then went to the last meeting the Board of Supervisors was having with the developers to celebrate this site for the ferry landing and pointed out to them that they couldn't build there. And it was a wonderful moment. They, <laughs> they expressed great anger. Another memory was Point Reyes, a number of projects out there. And there was a fellow named Bob Power that owned the nut tree and he was very environmental. And we got to know him, and he invited us out there, uh, and he, amid his eccentricities, was his interest in architecture, and he had a house built in a tree that was all glass. Glass walls, I mean, it was just, he was like being a squirrel up there. And that was a guest place. And I was working on him to donate some land to be part of the Point Ray Seashore. And he said, he was a good Republican. He said, I'll do this on one condition, that if I give it to you, you sell it to the Park Service. So I went to the Park Service, and the Park Service said, we only accept gifts of land from nonprofits. We don't buy them. And he said, well, and you're not going to get it. <clears throat> and in the end, they had to buy it from us. <clears throat> Another property from the corner of Bolinas Lagoon up to the North Ridge, 1,300 acres, was that white stone house. So beautiful. I tried to buy that for years, and <clears throat> one day the fellow who owned it called and he said, I'll be brief. If I don't come up with $15,000 by noon tomorrow, I lose millions. And he said, You've always wanted that? Do you still want it? I said, Yes, sir. He said, Well, can you come up with 15? I said, I'll come up with it. <clears throat> he talked about the price, and I said, $10,000 less than you paid for it. And he said, Well, all right. <clears throat> and I grabbed my tin cup and raced around, got 15,000 and met him, and that was that. So I called the Park Service in Washington and said, huzzah, we've gotten this key property. And the guy there on the phone was one of the top executives. He said, I don't care what you've done, we don't want it. We don't want an urban park. And I said, what? You know, I was on the line. It was the first project of the Trust for Public Land that I started. And it was really, I was sitting there, sweating at the desk, employees looking at me saying, well, when are we going to do something? And so I made my move, and it looked bad. And uh, I went back there and got a hold of somebody I knew and somebody else I knew, and soon was sitting with the Assistant Secretary of Interior. And he said, what do I want to do? I said, I showed him the map. He shouted at the Secretary, and he said, get that stupid SOB park director down here with this, this land guy. And they came in, and this fellow was notorious for being a mean, tough character. Nat Reed was his name, and from Florida. And <clears throat> he said, sit down. And these guys kind of meekly sat down. And he said, what is this crap that you don't want to buy, this bargain this guy's offering you? And the parks director was kind of said, well, he was mumbling, and his henchman in charge of acquisition said, I'll tell you, we don't want an urban park, that's what. And Reed looked at him and said, do you think you run interior somehow? And the guy was, he was a crusty old guy. And he kind of fumbled and he said, tell you what, gentlemen, I've got to go to lunch. It's noon. <clears throat> he got up to leave and they got up to leave. He said, no, not you. You stay here and acquire that property. Then you go to lunch. 
And that's how we got rid of that. That was a cold, really important start for the Trust for Public Land, I'll tell you that. <coughs> well, that was good. Thank you. <coughs> the second wave thing, I think we went through the era where we required most of the land that needs to be preserved. We still have a lot of organizations doing it, but those wonderful series of that era of m millions of acres of lovely landscape in a lot of places that were saved, are pretty much saved now. And uh, the environmental condition, that wave has dissipated. It was a land acquisition wave. The second wave coming is to preserve the places that we saved once before. Very often now, city councils will realize, gee, that land they say was worth $1,000 an acre, now it's worth $4 million an acre. And uh, geez, you know, they, you got into a lot of interesting uh, conflicts. Um, Los Altos Hills was a place that David Packard lived, for instance. And I acquired a 50-acre parcel at the request of the city from a wonderful old doctor once that one, a lot of stories about him, but the got the thing done. He wouldn't, he said, I don't trust the town. I'm not going to give it. And I said, look, if you'll give it, he lived in a shack in Texas, actually. You know, and he'd never answer mail. And I drove out there and talked to him for a couple of days. And he was an interesting storyteller. He said, I said, if you'll give it to us, we'll defend it with our, to our last breath and last dollar. And he said, fair enough. And we shook hands and he sent us a deed and then he passed away. And for all many years since, I have woke, awakened in the night knowing sooner or later somebody is going to try and develop that. Four acre minimum lot size in that humble village and uh, all mansions. And then they got some new people in the city council. They decided, ah, if we sold that 50 acres, we wouldn't have outsiders coming in here using our park, which was important to them. And secondly, we could build a city city building, the city hall, competitive in the beauty of architecture in the world. And so they started out to do that, and the little old people remembered when I was there before and called, and sure enough. So we put it together, and uh, it was pretty well, they had thought it out carefully and had attorneys going on and everything. Somebody had the bright idea of getting the school children of Los Altos Hills to do a newspaper titled, Save Our Park. <coughs> and they knocked on every door in town. And they did so well, there was a recall election, they threw those guys out of office. <coughs> but <coughs> that was a... And that has become Defensive Place, um, an organization that exists to do that. I have an office in Mill Valley on Blythdale, and I should have moved here 90 years ago. Better parking, close proximity to restaurants, friendly people. Anyway, the uh, stories like that go on and on. And uh, I think I will move from my discussion of the past into what I see as discussion of the present, and then I'm going to move on to the future, what I think we have to do. The, uh, how am I doing time-wise? somebody? Okay. <clears throat> One thing I decided at my Asian stage, it would be, I'd had so many happy experiences. You save a marsh someplace and everybody's cheered up. They throw a nice cocktail party and you get patted on the head and get a lot of free drinks. And uh, I kind of began to, that, that's when I left Nature Conservancy and started to trust for public land, for instance. The, uh, I felt the inner cities were going to be where elections will be decided. There was a Supreme Court decision, uh, reapportionment, I don't know if you remember that, one person, one vote. Until that happened, the rural states would get three votes for every one of ours, for instance. But if, with that in effect, if we in the cities didn't spread our knowledge so that the inner city dwellers and others voted on environmental affairs, we'd just be in trouble, we'd lose. And that's been happening somewhat, even now. And uh, 
we we got the the thing going, and uh, I thought further. Well, with the time I've got left, it would be interesting. I've been doing all these little projects. It would be interesting to try to think of something that we could do that might help the world, and something particularly concerning climate change, this new stress problem we face. And um, we thought and thought and came up with a, an idea, and that is rice. Deb, are you here? You've got to wave your arm somehow. I've got a partner. There she is, who runs the place, and uh, she will take contributions, she said. <laughs> um, the idea of rice and how you're going to help the world happened because I'm an ardent duck hunter. And I have a duck blind in the middle of a rice field with about 10,000 acres flooded. It's like being in the middle of the ocean. And you sit there for hours. Ducks aren't always cooperative. And I kept wondering, well, what in the world could be done with this water? They flood it in winter. They flood it because the rice is harvested. It's half cut off and leaves a stubble sticking up. And the farmer has to get rid of that before spring to plant. They used to burn it, but they can't anymore. And they found when they flooded it, it rotted, they said. And we got thinking about that. And I thought, you know, it'd be fun to... Another thing happened about that time. Some attorney called me up and said, would you have lunch with a client of mine? I didn't know him well, but I understand you fish. I said, yes. He said, well, my client wants to do something for fish in his will. So I met the guy once, didn't let him get a word in edgewise for an hour. Shook hands, he got the bill, and I left and forgot all about it. And the attorney called about five years later, a couple of years ago, and said, Boy, you really did a job at lunch. And I said, what are you talking about? I couldn't remember. The so lunch, I couldn't remember the guy or anything else. He said, yeah, you left your million and a half. And uh, you got to use it to help fish. So, in water, we went with it. So we ended up thinking, well, if you wonder what would happen if we put a bit of pond in the middle of these big rice, flooded rice fields anyway, and put in a little fish, what would happen? So we put in little salmon using his money and uh, spent three or four hundred thousand putting this whole thing together. And those little salmon just went, grew like crazy, record growing times with no food. And uh, we started digging around with scientists at Davis. Turns out that the so called rotting rice is being eaten by plankton, a small microorganism, I'll show you in a moment. Um, and they're by, they're by the trillions of tons, they've got to be, that we've never done anything with them. We just, after the winter, when they've eaten up all the grass, they pull the plug and drain the fields and dry it out and plant more rice. So with that, we decided to search further. The, uh, I was once a fisheries biologist. My friends in Sacramento said, Huey, we'll just tell you this. Salmon and trout, salmonids is the term they use are a very controversial subject to us. That's our career, keeping those babies floating in the public, paying taxes, and everybody cheered up by the whole thing. Don't fool around with salmonids. If you do something with fresh fish, we don't give a damn. So I moved our operation over, leaving another crew with the salmon thing, moved it over on the other side of the valley, the eastern side, and we planted small freshwater fish. Same thing happened. And the reason we did it is right now being seen in these starving sea lions we were reading about. The oceans back in the late 50s, Monterey, Steinbeck's story about Canary Row. Scientists kept warning us back then, don't take so many sardines. They've got, they've got to have density or they won't reproduce. Well, the lobbyists, they hired more and more lobbyists, and before long, the boats went out, there were no longer any sardines and the job, the industry was shut down. And right now, the same condition is happening. California doesn't allow fresh, I mean, saltwater fish farms, but we do allow fishermen to go out and catch all these food fish that fish, salmon live on, seals and whales live on, anchovies and herring and the kinds of small fish. And the main richest fishing ground in the world has been Peru. And for a long time, they'd send out 100 boats a day, load up on these little fish, bring them ashore, 
process them into meal and pellets and sell them all over the world, a stock feed, fish farm feed, whatever. They went out there a couple of months ago, there were no anchovies. And uh, the whole economy of that nation and those several other nations was built on that huge fishery that enjoyed for so long. And what has happened, there's about 50 saltwater fish farms going from here to the tip of South America, and they send their boats out and all along the coast of Mexico, and they keep throwing these anchovies and herring in there. And after a while, the populations dwindle, and things get tough. And so we don't know, other than we can see what happens to sea lions that are hungry, but you can imagine there's a whole array of other life forms fish underwater, seabirds that are starving out there because we're overfishing off the California coast and every other coast. Uh, the south coast, Atlantic coast has a, a fish called a menhaden and they have put, cut the take on that immediately now that they're beginning to realize that. And we have a commission here, Pacific Fisheries Commission, that is working to do the same thing. Anyway, I thought, well, gee, if we could raise freshwater fish in flooded rice fields in winter, there's 500,000 acres of rice fields in California that get flooded. We could substitute these fish and have the fishermen leave the fish in the ocean in the ocean. And that's what scientists are recommending. So I'm going to show you a, a brief introduction. We call this fish in the fields. I'm Huey Johnson, president of the Resource Renewal Institute. For 60 years, I've been looking for ideas that would solve environmental problems. Several years ago, I decided to try and help the oceans. The oceans are being overfished, particularly the base of the food chain, the food fish, herring, anchovies, and others. We realized that we could possibly substitute freshwater fish grown in flooded rice fields and not have to net so many fish in the ocean. The idea is working. We now have a program called Fish in the Fields, and it promises to deliver a lot of new protein for a protein-hungry world. This specially prepared video is an interim report to review the spectrum of the Fish in the Fields project. As you will see, this project makes use of rice fields currently unused in winter months that are teeming with protein-rich microorganisms called plankton. The experiment will study how small fish can sustainably be grown over the winter months. The small <coughs> fish serve as protein traps feeding solely on plankton and other organisms naturally present in the flooded fields. Growing fish in rice paddies is an age-old practice in Asia dating back 1200 years. Studies from Asia and elsewhere in the world show that rice fish coal culture benefits rice production by reducing the need for pesticides and fertilizer while providing an additional source of protein. California has 600,000 acres of rice fields, one third of which have sufficient water in the winter to support growing fish, so the potential is huge. Fish in the Fields is based on Rye's previous experiment of growing salmon in flooded fallow rice fields during the winter months and was located near Davis, north of the Yolo Bypass. The experiment was a success and the discovery was made that plankton, a naturally occurring microorganism <coughs> present in the flooded rice fields, provided a rich protein food source for the growth of young salmon. The salmon fingerlings grew rapidly over a five week period, doubling in length and increasing in weight five times, feeding solely on the plankton. However, in the second year of the salmon study, a huge percentage of the fish had been lost to bird predation and problems with water shortages. We have sited our Fish in the Fields project on the east side of the Sacramento Valley, where water is more reliable. Rye has been given the use of a 300-acre rice farm with abundant cold water fed by the Yuba River. Three 10-acre plots have been designed and constructed to raise three species of fish. The fish will be monitored and compared for survival and growth rates over a 12-week period. <coughs> a significant measurement will be the oil content of the fish, as that is a key component in any use of the fish for food sources. The whole process takes place between the rice harvest in fall and the preparation for a new rice crop in early spring. In late October, the rice was harvested and permits were obtained to raise fish. 
In November, <coughs> rice fields were disked to break down the rice stalks. Pond design is essential to the management and protection of the fish and was given careful consideration. Plots were designed and trenches were cut to provide channels for fish to escape from predators. A four foot deep trench was cut at the bottom of the plots with three feet deep trenches radiating out into the fields. Underwater reefs were constructed and protective netting was placed above the baseline trench. Drainage pipes were installed. Screens were placed so that individual fish species could be separated into ponds and so that the fish could not escape from the fields into the water system. Three species of fish were selected and fingerlings were ordered. Fields were flooded and the plankton was allowed to bloom over a two week period prior to the ponds being stocked. Water quality was tested and a baseline report was prepared. Water quality was shown to be good. Golden shiners, hybrid carp, and trout were placed in the individual ponds. Initial monitoring of the fish showed a 98% survival rate. Throughout December, January, and February, we continued to monitor the growth and survival of the fish. In late February, we will harvest a sample portion of the fish. We will measure their weight, length, and oil content. We are now at the... Well, that gives you the idea. <laughs> <laughs> Deborah Moskowitz's voice, whoop. Deborah Moskowitz's voice, who waved her arm earlier back there, did it. We got to blame her, I guess. Um, I will move to the future. I could go on for a long time. I, and one interesting job I had was being on the governor's cabinet in Sacramento in charge of environment. And I had a billion dollar annual budget and I had quite a bit of flexibility with it, and I had a lot of fun with it. Um, I have to admit, one thing I decided I was going to do was to take brush, chaparral off the mountain, put it in a big stuffer, like a sausage stuffer, and have it come out and get logs of compressed brush. It was a great idea, except it got so hot it blew up twice. <laughs> and I had to give that project up. But I did save 1,200 miles of wild rivers and a couple of million acres of wilderness that wouldn't have been saved otherwise, and generally improve things. But I'll that move on quickly to the future. The uh, reality is I looked, what, if, what is the future? You have to deal with climate change. Whatever you do, you're going to have to deal with climate change. We are. And um, I've noticed Los Angeles has advanced over all Northern California cities. Water conservation, they hadn't had a drop of new water in years, had millions of new people, and they were just fine. They're not short of water at all. They've managed their water, they conserve it, recycle it. They've had the same kind of record in energy and parks. And I went down there a couple of weeks ago and I just yesterday got a summary of a video I took someone down there I heard about. And one of the things we do here is interview people who've had a positive impact in their careers on environment. And then we end up putting it on the internet and there's 120 people interviewed on the internet, which I will give you an address to. But I don't see many brown faces here tonight. And I reflect that we are now a minority. We the Caucasians. And Hispanics, what are they doing down there? I mean, these things are looking much better than they are in our dominated white cities. And I went down and got a hold of one of these leaders I'd heard about. And this is an interview with him. Project 15 years ago, in 2000, this is our 15th anniversary year. We started the city project because the work needed to be done and nobody else was willing to do it. Came no one before. in Los Angeles was talking about parks as a civil rights, social justice, uh, equal justice issue. Indeed, um, we started building support for creating more park space in LA. We went to one mainstream environmental organization and testified before their board. And one of the board members asked, what do parks have to do with the environment? And we explained that for children in the inner city, uh, and from an environmental justice perspective, the, the environment is everywhere. It's where people live, learn, work, play, pray, 
age, uh, first of all, and second, for children in the inner city, if they don't see parks and grass and birds in their local park, they don't see parks and, and, and trees and grass and birds because uh, it's very unusual to go out to large open spaces in the middle of California or abroad and so on. So um, that was in 2000. Now in 2015, um, we've helped change the culture of LA and uh, there's a lot of effort afoot to green Los Angeles, to green the LA River, to uh, create a national monument in the San, Gabriel's, uh, San Gabriel Mountains and Watershed. So I think um, the City Project has had an impact in redefining the public dialogue about what a park is and the value of parks and the people we need to serve when we create parks. He was, uh, I say, born in Guatemala, he went to Stanford, got a law degree, that's just a little introduction. We should keep going a little more about him. Could you go ahead and hit him? In terms of my interest in the environment, environmental justice, and um, equal protection, first of all, I still remember when I was about 12 years old, one summer for summer for our summer vacation, my dad announced we were packing up the car and going uh, camping. And we went to Sequoia uh, National Park, Yosemite National Park, and Emerald Bay up at Lake Tahoe. And that's the first time I remember actually going out into wilderness and, and large green space. And I li we lived not far from here, uh, about a mile from here in downtown LA, which happens to be the most park poor area of California. So it was very cool to see Sequoia, Yosemite, and, and, and Emerald Bay. My family group that went backpacking, excuse me, went camping um, that summer was uh, my mother and father, my sister and I, but also my grandmother who was visiting us from New York, and Julio who was uh, the son of a friend from Guat Guatemala who lived about a mile or two away. And many years later, after we started doing the work of the City Project, we realized that is a pattern that distinguishes Latinos going into um, the wilderness and going camping. It's not just one or two people. It is multi-generational. It includes cousins, friends. Um, we go in much larger groups. So um, that's not something you know, I had realized. It was just a cultural, cultural trait. Having grown up in, in Los Angeles, which is park poor, I then went to college at, at Stanford, and I always heard the expression that Stanford looks like a country club, because it has rolling hills and everything, but I had never seen a country club. And then when I was in New York in law school, I spent one summer working for a large New York law firm, and we had a summer outing at a country club in Long Island, and I got there and I said, this place looks just like Stanford. <laughs> um, so I, I think that was, uh, where I developed an appreciation for green space and also an appreciation for the disparities in access to green space. Um, I went to Immaculate Conception School, which is about five blocks from my present office. And it's... Just received the uh, video and we're going to polish it into a, a 20 minute length film and it'll really be worth seeing. I have a program, as I mentioned, we've interviewed 120 people and we interview somebody for an hour and then boil down the interview to a five minute summary of wisdom from the interview. And so he was one of those. Well, coming to a conclusion, the uh, question if you're gonna deal with environment, you're gonna deal with anything, you damn well better be involved in politics and understand You've got to count your votes. And if the Hispanics, they right now will vote 75% for anything environmental, and more than that for climate change, and the Caucasians say the Senate, 46% of Americans don't believe that climate change is real. And 70 some, I think it was 77, 78% of the Hispanics do. So the green future, is going to be involved 
with people who speak Spanish, and all of us in dealing with the future had better get with it. I would like to close. He spoke in the end about a book, and he, in the interview, this book, is, this changes everything. And it's about climate change. And uh, this guy talks about it. I, I want to give this to Bill in appreciation of his good work and for the, your organization and putting this together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we have one other copy for the library. Well, I don't even like You can't get out of here quite yet. So we're going to open it up to Q&A right now. Thank you very much. I'm Thank you. I'm looking forward to reading this. And uh, we'll take Q&A for about 20 minutes. And then we'll wrap it up. And again, uh, before I do that, though, I want to mention that uh, Huey's been generous enough I to. Uh, I better use a mic. Okay. So before we open up to Q and A, I, I wanted to um, bring up one other event you may be interested in. We haven't set the date yet, but Huey has um, been kind enough to say that he would be willing to participate in a, uh, a fundraising event for RRI in coordination with the Historical Society. We haven't completely scoped out what it's going to look like. It's going to be dependent upon the level of interest. And, but the general plan is to have something like a, a hike from the uh, parking lot at Tennessee Valley parking lot at the stables up Marincello to the top where we would meet with Huey and we would have a conversation at the top. Uh, we still have to figure out how the logistics around that because depending on the size of the group, um, it's going to sort of shape how we do this, permitting and so on. At the front table, we've got some registration indication forms. So if you're interested in doing this, if you could leave us your name and contact information, it'll give us an idea about how to best design this. It'll be in the near future within a, a few weeks, I'm sure, depending on Huey's schedule and what we can put together. So please consider doing that and sign up for that. And with that, I'll turn it over to Q&A. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. My question is, is simply, how can we best get involved in making a difference? Well, for one thing, you should read that book. What is the book? This Changes Everything is a title. It was the New York Times Book Review said that this was the most important environmental book since Silent Spring, and enraged with that. The author is a Canadian woman, and. Uh, Pass it around. It's, it's a good one. I'm going to leave one with the library as well. Yui, would yes. You, would you be willing to restate the question? All right. Sure, I can do that. The question is, how are we going to be, take care of the established waterfall? The waterfall of North America, Pacific Coast Flyway, come down and they spend the winters in that flooded rice. Well, it doesn't, no change will be occurred. The ducks don't eat the, the micro things. They eat spilled grain and so on. And all we're going to do is have a pen of several acres in a corner of a field and circulate the water in the rice field into the pen like having a pen with pigs in it and bringing corn to the pigs. In this case, the organisms in the water will just be carried by the current into this pen and circulated out, but it doesn't affect waterfowl in any way. Yes? Uh, Huey, with your interest in, in comprehensive planning, I thought you should know that Caltrans has issued a new statewide transportation plan it shows how to accomplish an 80% reduction in greenhouse gases. Wow. So this is, I believe, your vision is actually actually arrived at Caltrans. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's very important. Yes, ma'am. Um, what are your ideas for addressing the drought the California faces without sacrificing the drought? Well, there's one thing you could do, and it would take care of the water shortage. 
and that is what the Spanish did. They watered their gardens with a water can, and they didn't water any lawns. They didn't irrigate. And all we need to do is stop watering lawns, and we'll have all the water we need. And, and water, water politics drive, drive Sacramento. And California has the worst water policies of any state in the nation, as corrupt as can be, and nobody seems able to do anything about it. Yes? I couldn't hear you. Would you describe what happened with you and Marty Rosen, Keith, what you've done local in forming the Homestead Valley Land Trust? Uh, Back in the 70s. Yeah, I was this in uh, Tam, Tam Valley or? No, Homestead. Homestead. Yeah, I, that was one of the first land trust things. We came upon a kind, unsuspecting lady who owned a parcel of land. And uh, she was interested in the environment, and before long she'd given us her parcel to be a, easements to be a land trust. And I got a letter from her a couple of years ago. It was just, it'd been 25 years or more since I, we'd done that. And this strange letter, she said, I want to thank you. We haven't talked in 20 years, but I've, she remembered everything point by point. And she was suffering from a terminal illness, it turns out. And she was taking the time to write everybody that had affected the happiness in her life. It was a strange and touching experience. Yes, sir. I know you were involved with Saving Slide Ranch. Could you mm -hmm. tell us some of the background of that? <laughs> Slide Ranch is one of the coastal properties that was preserved. And uh, it was... Uh, owned by people who didn't pay much attention to it, and a group of kind of very pleasant squatters had moved in there, taken over the place, and it was a hippie era, and uh, they took good care of it, pretty much, and were interested in education and children, one thing or another. But then they left, and some very tough drug people moved in. And Doug Ferguson had more to do with it than I did. And he was enamored with that place. And so these guys would threaten you when you'd go in there. And the public had always gone in there fishing, for instance. So he got a group of Hell's Angels <laughs> to visit the place <clears throat> and come roaring in and tell those people they'd better get out of there or else. And they left. So we were able to acquire it. Yep. Ah. You, you said a moment ago that the uh, shenanigans going on with the water in California is totally and utterly corrupt. Yeah. And has been for some years. Mm -hmm. Decades. Decades. It, and how is it that nobody has addressed this that, that, that I'm aware of, certainly? I, I don't know anybody else about it. And if. Why can't something be done about it, put it that way? <laughs> <laughs> well, in part, you can't have a farm in California unless you have water. And the earliest pioneers grabbed all the water and then it kind of dissipated in a legal process or half-baked legal process. And uh, a lot has been written about it. Uh, we have a fellow here, Jacques Leslie, who does nothing else. <laughs> He's making a living on <laughs> problem. Uh, you might wave your hand, Zach. <laughs> um, the idea of population increase and the competition from between the urban and rural users and irrigating the desert. There's no shortage of land in California. If you can get some water, hey, if you get enough water, you can become a billionaire. The guy's down there, what's his name? Deb, what's his name? Stuart Resnick. Stuart Resnick. Um, is, he gets California, he donates a lot of money to political campaigns, and then he's able to maneuver and get excess water, he calls it. And he irrigates, he's put in 40, I don't know, 
40,000 acres or something, new almonds in the desert, an unheard of thing. But he has a political call to do it because of the contributions he makes. So unless you get campaign finance reform, you're not going to get much improvement because they just buy the committees. Yes, sir. What's your feeling on hydroponics possibly being a part of the solution for the need for more water with the fact that it has like a 90% water um, return on it? Yeah, re reuse. 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 Mm -hmm. I hear that they're doing a lot of this in the Netherlands where they're doing outdoor uh, atriums or whatever they're called, those long buildings. Yes. And you think that that might happen here? We, we may use a lot less water doing it. I know it's a hell of an investment up front, but then we get all of our organics that we're looking for. We get to cut down on our insects and all that. Do you think that that might be part of the future? Oh, I'm sure it would be. It, I have fallen behind on being informed about that. It makes, I, I've done a lot of work in the Netherlands, and they really have innovative things that, in agriculture and water use. But I can't be of help to you. Miss Ives, I believe. You may have asked a question and provided an answer. I couldn't catch the end of your presentation. I just wondered if you could speak to the, to the salmon well, crisis. In Coho, or silver salmon, is a small salmon. The Chinooks that we fish for from boats are big, usually. And the Cohos spawn in coastal streams. They'll just go in a couple of miles, and that's it. Redwood Creek, coming to Muir Beach, has spawning fish in it, as do these small streams along the coast. But also, it's been a place for development. The uh, salmon are not the fish that go jumping up over waterfalls. They are, deal more comfortably with gentle water. And they spawn, and another generation comes. And the fish spend a year in the water, in the st natal stream, so-called. And uh, they are bothered by silt, these little streams that they use are constantly being disrupted. The logging in the creek bottoms allows silt to get in there and, and choke their nests. And humanity over time has impacted the quality and survival of silver salmon. And this is true of all salmon. The salmon is really an indicator of how well we're doing with the environment. And if you let the salmon go, you better wave yourself goodbye. And it's awfully important to understand that and defend them and stand up for them. Uh, write letters to the editor, write your legislators. A dozen letters to a legislator on any subject will just about turn them inside out. I was surprised when I was in Sacramento how effective a handful of letters would be. The guy, the last thing a politician wants to do is to have an issue become a big issue. They've got to stamp them out early if they're critical ones. So a dozen letters is an issue on its rise. Yes, ma'am. Can you share some thoughts about uh, the new comprehensive access that is going to be created for all the open space in Rim County? There's a trail. Oh. You know, I haven't followed it. I uh, Even living in Mill Valley for these 50 years I've been in this business. At first, I would have been, I was working for the Nature Conservancy and I could just as well have been called the Marin Conservancy. I had 13 states, but the phone rang all the time with people with problems in Marin and I would often solve them. But in time, I realized that it was not what I was getting paid to do. And I was working more and more on a broader national, U.S. national, international scale. Uh, I had, there's a woman named Wangari Matai that is a Kenyan. She received the first 
Nobel Peace Prize as an environmentalist, and we started her out here. We had her books in our little office for half a dozen years when she was first beginning her international stuff. And I had the honor and pleasure of being in her ceremony in Oslo when she was given the award. And um, that has kept me away often. I, I often get involved in policy. It interests me a great deal to see how a state or nation or political body is going to handle some issue and to get involved in it. And so I feel over the years that I had less and less freedom to try and work in Marin. I'm very lucky to be here now in Mill Valley. Um, we find survival is tougher here. Fundraising is really difficult. If any of you know the foundation that we could talk to or sell the idea on or work with, we'd love the introduction. Our office is at 187 East Blythdale, and um, we are looking at ideas dealing with the future and think we're going to make a difference in the world. So a group of us recently defeated the Park Service plan to build a parking lot up on the panoramic bridgeway <laughs> on the way up to Mount Town. Yeah. The, um, well, I agree with you. I think that government prints money. <laughs> and uh, the activist environmentalists that have traditionally made a difference have been willing to be tough and to stand up and be heard and challenge politicians, challenge issues. And um, the idea of raising money from philanthropy in San Francisco, there's... Um, the land trust idea, I was, had a lot to do with starting it originally, but I'm not comfortable as, it, as just a fundraising effort. It ought to do something, and volunteers do a tremendous job with these organizations, separating that from their fundraising arm. They've, the one, fund, the one uh, group on the coast out here has raised 300 million, 400 million dollars, which in essence they've given to the Park Service. And uh, the Park Service needs friends and to be respected who are cranky as hell with politicians. Far worse than it needs, needs money. And nobody ever criticizes anything that's raising money in one of these land trusts that I've seen anyway. And uh, that's all that counts. If you want to straighten out the park service, or you want to get water policy changes, or you want to improve your roads or schools, the same thing happens in a free society. You've got to go out and make it happen. If you're raising money from the philanthropy area, San Francisco, the symphony, education groups, and so on, are all dented by this 400 million that this land trust has raised and wonderful cocktail parties raising it, but it doesn't do a lot of good. The amount of money the parks need is so immense compared to whatever you raise that I question this logic. And I get a lot of disagreement from that. Many people in a free society happily have a different feeling about it, and I'm sure there are people in the audience who would disagree with me. Yes, ma'am. Where, where do you stand on the oyster farm? <laughs> 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 uh, 
Aha, I stood. I still do. There's a word called public trust. And this interview with this fellow in Los Angeles, at the end of it, he gets on public trust and talks about climate change. But the idea of he's the parks where he talks about some billionaires in Malibu who wanted to not let the public use the beach. And he and his groups defied them and won. Went to court and what have you. Same way with some Indians had a, a holy ground down there. And um, the public trust idea that you defend the integrity of, of a principle is um, much of what environmental quality is about, for sure. I don't know if that helps. I think we have time for one last question. And I also want to remind you again, to the extent you can help tear, us, tear down and put things back in order, that would be very <coughs> helpful tonight. Thank you. Yes, sir. You know, I don't know. I, at one time, the Sierra Club was adamantly engaged in the population debate. And one of the interesting chapters in this book we're passing around is called Big Green, teaming up with corporations. And they don't want to get embarrassed, and they're more and more getting large contributions from corporate sources. It mentions that the Sierra Club accepted millions from an oil company. I didn't know that until I read that book. And it really, really made me mad. I sent him a stiff letter about it. Um, fundraising is survival, and uh, to deal with population means you've got a guaranteed controversy. And I enjoy controversy, so I don't mind that. And I've written about it. But we really had we've got to do something about that. That's the driving negative force in anything we try to do permanently. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you.